not anything worth bragging about, given how long I spent uh, in seminary. I was in formation for about eight years. Uh, so it really isn't anything to brag about that I know probably too much about the Eucharist to make this easy. Uh, I started thinking about it, and you know, it occurred to me that you guys are grad students and enthusiastic Catholics, which is awesome, by the way, for priests to have audiences like you. But it also means that, you know, not too clear, uh, people, people are at different places uh, in their faith, uh, what they know about any given particular subject related to the faith. I know you guys just watched, uh, many of you have recently watched Father Robert Barron's Catholicism series, so I thought probably not cover the Eucharist on the most basic level. Uh, so it, essentially what I did was I chose uh, a relatively accessible book, uh, and it's something that can really infuse a new experience, uh, a new perspective into your experience of the Eucharist, and that's something that I greatly appreciate. Uh, I love theology, like hardcore, metaphysics, just asking the most difficult, most obscure questions you can get, but that's usually not something that most people want to hear about. But uh, biblical typology, like the story of the development of salvation history appeals to me really deeply. Nevertheless, at the risk of uh, giving you guys uh, a lot of material that you've already been familiar with or that you're not particularly interested in, I decided to uh, offer two further resources because I think at the very least uh, after, I, I got a bookshelf at home literally this wide with just books on the Eucharist. And so I decided I should at the very least be able to give you something, uh, give you, point you in the right direction, depending on where you're at. So, uh, this book, look how beautifully brief that is. <laughs> this is uh, a book by Father Raniero Cantal Mesa. Raniero Cantal Mesa is the preacher in the apostolic household. He's been the Pope's official retreat preacher since shortly after John Paul II began uh, his pontificate. And this is a wonderful devotional work. There's some powerful penetrating insights into the theology of the Eucharist, which is great, uh, but it's principally a devotional work. So if that's where you're at, if that's what you're looking for, this is a fantastic place to go. Uh, here, on the other end of the spectrum, is a book by Cardinal Charles Journet, who is a French father of the Second Vatican Council, a very famous theologian. Uh, he did write a very accessible book on grace, but this is a book on the theology of the Mass, and it is as intense and scholastic and philosophical and detailed as you could, anything that you could possibly find. So if you want to go really deep, if you want to, or just want to have a resource that you can go to for the most random questions, this is, this is the place to go, Cardinal Journée. So what I'm going to be talking about tonight, on the other hand, is a, uh, it's a newer book, it's relatively accessible, which is uncommon among books on the Eucharist. I found that I went over my whole bookshelf and I saw that uh, I started pulling them off and, and reading them, and they were about half, uh, well, I would say about a third, like, very engaging, devotional uh, material, about a third fluff, and about a third really intense theology, which doesn't do most people a lot of good, unless you're willing to wade through the fluff and you're looking also for deeper theology. Uh, this book, The Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, uh, it covers biblical typology of what was going on at the Last Supper, so that's what we're going to be talking about about tonight. So, that Jesus was Jewish is something that is obvious to everybody. However, in our, uh, when we imagine Jesus, when we place ourselves 
in his, in his life. Try to imagine what he felt that he was doing. It's really easy to let the fact that he was Jewish fall by the wayside, his perspective. Jewish, uh, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. He studied Torah. He uh, went to the temple three times a year with his family to celebrate the high holidays. And the people that he preached to were Jewish. And this is something to keep in mind. Why that's relevant to this discussion is that the Eucharist, what he had to say about the bread and the wine, that this is his body and his blood, and that you have to eat it. You have to eat his body and drink his blood in order to have eternal life, in order to participate in the new covenant. Most of it, everybody here knows that that would have been shocking, would have been even horrifying to his Jewish audience. But God knew that. So why should that have been the case? Did this completely come out of right field? Why on earth would God establish a salvation history that pointed in one direction and all of a sudden pointed in completely the opposite direction? That's uh, kind of what we want to address tonight. The first place, uh, the first thing to, to remember is that uh, twice in, uh, in the Torah, God forbids the drinking of blood. That it is to desecrate oneself because it's to take into oneself the life of an animal. So, in order to, to better understand why Jesus, why this should have been a part of God's plan to teach the people of Israel these principles, give them these laws, and then hold out his body and blood, why that should have been the case, we need not only to go to the Jewish scriptures, but also to Jewish tradition, more particularly the Jewish tradition as it was practiced at the time of Jesus. The scriptures and tradition, and the resources that we use, uh, would, uh, in addition to the Jewish scriptures, then would be the Mishnah, which is a collection of the Jewish oral tradition, the Talmud, which is kind of a commentary, a developing commentary that went on for centuries, commentary on the Mishnah, as well as the Torah, as well as the Law. Uh, the Targums, which were translations of the scriptures, but with some kind of creative elaborations. It was uh, the scriptures infused with all kinds of theology and tradition. Uh, and so from these, from this Jewish tradition, we, uh, we want to draw out what was Jesus shooting for? What, how did Jesus see his own role in salvation history? In particular, his death on the cross and the, uh, and the Last Supper. So, what kind of Messiah were the Jews at the time of Jesus expecting? It's very common to hear uh, in the last, I don't know, as long as I've been alive, that the kind of Messiah that the Jews were expecting, that the kind of Jew, the Messiah that the Jews were longing for, was a political Messiah. Somebody who would sweep in and rally all of Israel around him, cast out the Roman occupiers, and establish uh, reestablish the covenant, reestablish the Davidic kingdom. But while this is true in some sense, and there were some people at that time who were only looking for a political Messiah, at the time of Jesus they would have been referred to as zealots. While there's some looking only for a political Messiah, the tradition at the time of Jesus was looking for something much more significant than that. Uh, first of all, the 
Jews at the time of Jesus were expecting a recapitulation, a recap, a renewal of their foundational experience of salvation, the experience of exodus, God freeing them, liberating them from those who oppressed them, leading them into a new promised land, establishing a new covenant with them. So, the Jews, first of all, were looking for a new Moses. Moses, considered the greatest prophet of all of Israel, all of Israel's history. One of their own, one of their own, who knew God face to face, who had led them out of Egypt. Israel, though, once they had been led out of Egypt and established their new home in the Promised Land, things turned sour. They turned back to idolatry. Eventually they were exiled. Nevertheless, over the course of the prophetic tradition, these prophets wanted to give the people hope and the message that they delivered was of this new exodus, this new covenant, a new Moses to come. The new covenant. A new covenant in the same, in the same line as the uh, covenant that occurred at Sinai. Moses leads the people of Israel out of Egypt. Immediately after Pharaoh and his armies are drowned in the Red Sea. Moses goes up Mount Sinai and brings back with him the law. And after the recognition that Israel had, uh, Israel had rebelled, almost immediately after being released from Israel, Moses establishes a new covenant, or a covenant, a covenant different from that that was established by Abraham, with Abraham, with the patriarchs. The, the reason that God had led Israel out of Egypt was to establish this covenant with them by worship. The covenant that God established with Abraham looked very bloody. An animal was cut in two. And between the two halves, both Abraham and a brazier that represented God's presence passed through. It represented this new familial bond that they were to share. This covenant, though, this covenant with the people of Israel, it was based first on this new law that Moses brought. From down the mountain, Moses proclaims to them the law that had been delivered into his hands by God. It's followed by sacrifice. Moses takes the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkles it over the people and declares to them, after they have agreed to this covenant, this, this is a bond, this is a new familial relationship that they have with the God who freed them. And one of the most interesting things about this covenant, one of the things that's easily overlooked, like all covenants, like all sacrifices, it's not completed with the death or the offering of the sacrifice. It is completed with a meal. Moses and the leaders of the 12 tribes are led back up Mount Sinai and in the book of Exodus, we read that the ground that he walked on was a transparent sapphire. And Moses and the leaders of the people of Israel ate in God's presence. It said God did not lay a hand on them, but they ate in God's presence. And they came back down. And that this new covenant, this relationship with God, was that familiar. 
as familiar as eating a meal with one's family. A new covenant, a new covenant was expected from the Messiah. The patriarchs were without a temple, but with this new, with this covenant established by Moses, along with the law, God instructed them on how to build the tabernacle, a tent where God's presence would abide. Within this temple, uh, within this tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant would be kept. The Ark of the Covenant, along with the Ten Commandments, along with a container of the manna which fell from heaven later on, which will come to you shortly. A menorah, a great candelabra, and then finally a table, a table for the bread of the presence, showbread, along with the other vessels of sacrifice. This temple, the uh, tabernacle, was eventually transformed into the temple at the time of David. Later on, in 587 BC, the Babylonians not only defeated the people of Israel, but raised Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. And for right around 50 years, they remained in exile until Cyrus the Persian defeated the Babylonians and allowed them to return to Israel to build a new temple. But the temple that they desired was far greater than anything that they could construct at that time. It says that the, the old men who remembered the original temple wept. They wept on seeing this recreation, this reconstruction of the temple. And they longed for a renewed temple. And this was another aspect of the new covenant that was promised. A new promised land, a new promised land was expected with the Messiah. Not only did the people of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin who had been exiled into Babylon, not only did they expect a renewed return to their homeland, but the northern ten kingdoms had been dispersed and lost to all the world, at least culturally. But the prophets, they proclaim that when God reestablishes his covenant with the people, it will be not only, not only Judah, but all of the tribes of Israel that will experience this new promised land. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, goes so far as to call it a new heaven and a new earth. Not merely a return to the land that they had been living on, but a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus then. Jesus grew up with these traditions. Jesus grew up with these expectations for the new covenant. That the Messiah would be not only a new king, but a new Moses to teach the people the new covenant. And he established a new covenant with them by a new type of sacrifice, a new type of worship. That there would be a new temple, a new means of offering the sacrifice. Finally, a new promised land. To understand what Jesus intended to do at the Last Supper, we need to understand what was going on in a Passover, in a, technical, in a typical Passover. First of all, the Passover lamb, the offering held up to God was an unblemished lamb, a lamb a year old. Not any lamb, one that, a lamb that was without defect, and a year old 
in its prime. Occurred every year on the 14th day of the month of Nisan in the spring, usually March or April. It was important that no bone of this lamb be broken. It was to be spitted, a, uh, a pole driven through and roasted whole. The blood of the lamb was removed by slitting the lamb's throat and the blood collected in a bowl. That blood would later be spread over the doorposts and the lintel of the houses of the people of Israel. They were to eat, not just to sacrifice this animal, but to eat this animal. Five times in the passage in Exodus where the instructions for the Passover are laid out. Five times it commands them to eat this Passover lamb. Roasted whole. Very like the Toda sacrifice, which you can read about in the book of Leviticus. Not only that, but it was commanded to be repeated to be repeated as a day of remembrance. Now, at the time of Jesus, things look different. Rather than celebrated entirely by a household, the uh, Passover was required to be sacrificed in Jerusalem, in the temple. And it would have been a spectacular sight to have seen. The, uh, the historian Josephus, who's a contemporary, more or less, of Jesus, was not just a historian, but a priest. And he recounted what the uh, Passover sacrifice in Jerusalem at the time would have looked like. He said between the hours of 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock, 250,000 lambs were sacrificed. They would come in in groups of three. It was practically an assembly. They would have the bowls, silver and gold bowls, waiting for them. And the throats of the animals would be slit at once. And the bowls would be passed back, uh, fire brigade style, and thrown at, uh, at the foot of the altar. And over the course of those two hours, 250,000 lambs were sacrificed. And according to you know, the number of a typical family, there were probably well over two million people then who celebrated the Passover in Jerusalem every year. Jesus would have seen this. Jesus would have been present for this sacrifice. Another interesting thing, not only the, not only the quantity of blood, but the way the way that these lambs were prepared for, uh, for the meal. Not only were they spitted down the middle, down the center, but another spit was inserted through the shoulders. It was in the shape of a cross that these lambs were prepared for, uh, for the meal. We read about this uh, in Midrash and in the early church fathers, Justin, Jerome, they point out that Jesus was himself sacrificed according to the type of the Passover lamb. Now Jesus, all this was in Jesus' mind on the night that he celebrated the tour, at the night that he celebrated his Passover which was in some ways very similar to a typical Passover, and in some ways very different. We know in fact that it was a Passover meal that he intended, although in recent years scholars have debated, uh, some scholars have downplayed its relation to the 
Passover meal. Some even saying that it wasn't, wasn't in any way. But uh, this is very much contradicted by what we read in the scripture. Jesus tells his disciples explicitly to go to Jerusalem and prepare a sac uh, prepare uh, the, the Passover. He tells them to go find a man and just to let him know that he and his disciples will be celebrating the Passover there. It occurred at night. They didn't celebrate it in Bethany, where they were staying. It says explicitly that they were staying in Bethany. But they celebrated this meal in Jerusalem. They drank wine rather than the typical uh, meal drank with water. And more than that, Jesus gave an explanation of what was going on. The same type of explanation that would have been given for the Passover. Lots of things were different about this Passover. Jesus was not the father of this household. The one who would typically lead the Passover meal. He describes it as a new covenant. He describes the bread and wine not in terms of the old covenant, but in terms of a new. It's celebrated with bread and wine rather than the rather than the typical. Passover lamb, the bitter herbs, the unleavened bread, and uh, the sauce that the bread would be dipped in. But the Christian tradition is very clear about the fact that to celebrate, to participate in this meal was to participate in a Passover. Not only was this a Passover, but it was a recapitulation of God's saving act in the wilderness. The manna by which the people of Israel were fed was kept in the tabernacle within the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. And the Jewish tradition about this was, was very relevant. The Jewish tradition at the time pointed out the fact that this was a miraculous food. It appeared every morning from the time of the exodus from Egypt up until the moment when they entered into the promised land. The tabernacle itself was seen as a earthly figure, an earthly figure of the true reality in heaven. It was described as tasting like honey. The uh, Jewish tradition at the time, at the time of Jesus, described this manna as being present from the foundation of the world from the time of creation itself, that it existed at the time of Adam and Eve. And so this food, this food that God, by which Israel was fed, was uncorrupted by the fall. They believed that it was kept internally in the heavenly temple, that while the gift of man had ceased when they entered into the promised land, that the manna still existed in the tabernacle of heaven. And finally, that the manna itself would return, would be offered to them again at the time that the Messiah was revealed. Jesus himself refers to the manna once in particular, most significantly, in the discourse, in the bread of life discourse. When Jesus speaks of his body and his blood, he speaks of the Holy Eucharist. He chooses not to describe it in terms of 
the Paschal sacrifice of the Passover, but in terms of the manna from heaven. This bread of life's discourse followed immediately after the feeding of the 5,000. The expectation of the people at the time, given these prophecies, given that they believed that the Messiah would bring with him, would be himself be a new Moses, would bring a new manna. They, once they experienced this, the feeding of the 5,000, they challenged Jesus. The uh, bread that fell from heaven in the desert was offered for 40 years, but these people said, Jesus, give us this manna always. Give us this manna always. As we all know, as all good Catholics know, having studied the Bread of Life discourse over and over again, these people took them literally. They didn't assume it was a metaphor. And when they did, Jesus didn't correct them. He could very well have in the boat when Jesus told his disciples to beware of the manna, beware of the bread of the Pharisees. They asked among themselves whether he was talking about literal bread. And he said, do you not perceive? He corrected their misunderstanding. But this wasn't so. Not in the, uh, not in the case of the bread of life discourse. In the reason, then, one of the reasons that we have to think that it was necessary for Jesus to offer not only his body and his blood, despite the prohibition against consuming blood, was precisely because of what the scriptures describe blood as, as the life itself of the animal. Jesus describes this new bread from heaven as his flesh and his blood. What he's offering them, and what he desires for them to receive, is his own life. Finally, the bread of the presence was another type of the Eucharist. Within the tabernacle, uh, as I said, within the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant the menorah, and the golden table of the bread of the presence. On this table were spread out twelve loaves, replaced every week. And that this was not just uh, a ritual meal, it is demonstrated by the fact that incense was placed on this table. It's referred to explicitly as a sacrifice. This bread on the altar of the bread of the presence, the table of the bread of the presence. It's referred to as the bread in Leviticus as the bread of the everlasting covenant. The priest and king Melchizedek when uh, Abraham first entered into the Promised Land, after having defeated some pagan kings, made a sacrifice, offered up a sacrifice to God through the priest Melchizedek. And it was not of an animal. It was of bread and of wine. And in the temple itself, every week, this bread of the presence would be laid out before God, and every week the priests would consume the bread of the presence. The Jewish tradition of the time held that this bread of the presence had miraculous qualities, that during the time of a particularly holy priest, if the high priest was particularly holy, one could take a piece of this bread of the presence as small as the size of an olive and consume it 
and be sustained for an entire day. Even traditions of, of receiving that size of a morsel and not being able to finish it. Most, most interestingly, most spectacularly, this bread, which was confined to the sanctum, confined to the temple, was very unlike the time of the, uh, the kings of Israel. At the time of Jesus, we know for a fact that three times a year, in particular the three times of year the Jewish men in the Holy Land were required to come to return to Israel, three times a year, this table of the bread of presence, the golden table, which itself had bars along uh, that ran through it, very much like the uh, the Ark of the Covenant, would be carried out. Would be carried out before the crowds of people, and it would be raised up the table with the bread of presence, and they would declare, "Behold the love of God." Behold the love of God. There are various theories about, about this. Some of the uh, deeper, more mystical interpretations of the bread of the presence at the time of Jesus uh, has as much to do with the etymology of the word. The word for presence in Hebrew means is the same word as a face. To be present to someone is to be present to their face. You could easily translate this word as the bread of the face. Of God. And it was referred to explicitly as the bread of the covenant. We need to return back to that, that event, the, the culmination of the establishment of the covenant at Sinai, when Moses and the leaders of the twelve tribes went up, up the mountain, and ate, and ate in the presence of God. This was a type. This was a type of that experience. Uh, there are Jewish scholars that speculate that this was, that the reason that this occurred was for the sake of the experience of a theophany, the experience of God's presence itself. They believed that this bread was changed. The tradition was that this bread was changed when it was offered up to God. That this miraculous effect wouldn't occur just when they baked it, but only when it was consecrated would it have this miraculous effect. Only then would it be truly God's presence. And then, again, three times a year, when all of the men of Israel came to Jerusalem, this table was held aloft for all to see. And they cried out, Behold the love of God. Jesus, Jesus himself knew of these traditions. Every one of these traditions at the time of his Passover, of his Passover meal. It's important, it's just as important to have uh, an understanding of what a Passover meal would have looked like at the time of Jesus Christ. The description of the Passover meal in the book of Exodus and the places where it's referred back to in the Torah are, are very spare and the tradition developed significantly over years. First of all, in the fact that it had to be carried out in Jerusalem rather than simply in every uh, individual's household. Uh, in both the Mishnah, the, uh, the record of the early oral traditions and a supplement called the Tosefta. The uh, Passover meal was described as first being preceded by a fast. From the time of the evening sacrifice until nightfall, a fast was required in order to participate in the Passover. These uh, traditions also refer to the necessity 
of receiving four cups of wine. That unless these four cups are drank, that the Passover has not taken place, that the requirements of the law haven't been satisfied. The first cup was called the Kiddush. It's uh, the same word that the angels, that the uh, seraphim, cherubim and seraphim, cry out before God in the beginning of the book of Isaiah, holy, holy, holy. It's the sanctification, it's the consecration of this meal, of the blessing. Once this uh, cup of wine was first mixed with water and then blessed, the food would be brought out. The Passover lamb, the uh, bitter herbs, the unleavened bread, and the uh, material that the bread was so, uh, dipped in, the haraseth. Then the second cup was mixed but not drank. It was mixed but not drank. The son, the son of the, the oldest son, the eldest son of the father of the household would ask the question, why is this different from any other night? And the father would recount the story of the Passover uh, from Deuteronomy 26, which begins, A wandering Aramean was my father. Famous verse. That's how it would begin. And they would begin singing a series of psalms from Psalm 113 up to 118. These were referred to as the Hallel Psalms, the Psalms of Praise. And the first two psalms would be sung. This cup, the second cup, would be consumed after the explanation of what the meal was. The third cup was then mixed, but not drank. The blessing, the blessing over the bread was said. Uh, a morsel of the unleavened bread was then dipped in the Haraseth. And the meal itself would begin. This would end with the blessing, uh, the blessing of the cup and its consumption. Finally, the fourth cup, the last of the cup, the Hallel, the cup of praise, uh, would begin by the cup being mixed, and then Psalms 115 through 118 would be recited. And I'm going to point those out precisely because these would have been read aloud, these would have been sung aloud by Jesus immediately preceding his death. Psalm 116, what shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I shall lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his holy ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And it would end with Psalm 118. Out of my distress I called to the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. I shall not die, but I shall live. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. These psalms that Jesus prayed would have been practically an instruction manual for what was to take place, what was to take place on the next day. Now, what about the cups at the Last Supper? Do we find anything similar, anything related to this Passover tradition in the, uh, in the Gospel account of the Last Supper? Interestingly enough, the Gospel of Luke in particular refers to multiple cups. There is a cup, it says, after supper. This couldn't have been other than the third cup, the cup of blessing, the cup of the Barakah. The second cup, then, the first cup that it refers to, 
immediately preceded Jesus' account of this new covenant that he was establishing. In the very same way that the second cup, this cup of proclamation in the Jewish Passover, preceded the account of God's salvation of the people of Israel. Interestingly enough, then, no fourth cup is referred to, not at the Passover. Now, another cup will be referred to several times succeeding, following the past, uh, Jesus' own Last Supper. First of all, in the Garden of Gethsemane, three times this cup is referred to, a cup is referred to in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prays that this cup would pass for him, but then he tells God the Father that he will accept this cup. On the way, on the way to the crucifixion, when they finally arrive as at the site where he would be executed, women offer him wine mixed with gall, uh, wine mixed with uh, with myrrh. At the time, we have records of a Jewish tradition that to everyone who was going to be executed, wine mixed with myrrh would be offered them in order to dull the pain. And what the Gospel says about this is that Jesus tasted it. And as soon as he tasted it, as soon as he realized what it was, he said he, would, he refused to drink. He said he wouldn't drink it. The Gospel of John, finally, records one of Jesus' last sayings. What John says is the very last, uh, second to last thing that Jesus says. I thirst. They hold up to him a uh, branch with hyssop, with wine uh, soaked into it. Jesus says, I thirst, and he drinks this wine that is offered to him. What we see, what we can see, is that this reality that whatever Jesus believed he was beginning in the Passover, he, be he believed wasn't completed until he received this wine, until he drank of the fourth cup. These, uh, these types of the new covenant, these things that were expected of the Messiah, a new Passover, a new temple, a new covenant, the new manna from heaven, and even the bread of the presence are all represented in the sacrifice that Jesus offered, which began with the meal that he celebrated, that he referred to explicitly as a sacrifice, his bread offered and his wine poured out, and completed on the cross. The cross itself wouldn't have looked like a sacrifice to Jews at the time of Jesus. There was no priest, there was no obvious offering. The only way that we could understand the cross as a sacrifice, as a sacrifice proper, is understanding it in terms of the Last Supper. The Last Supper and Jesus' offering were one and the same reality. I think, yes, I'm going to call it. <laughs> uh, questions about the uh, Old Testament typology of, yes? I don't know if you answered it. I've been nagging me here. Yes. So, I think in the 50s in Isaiah, the yes. uh, prophecy that we always close, you know, uh, uh, who is wounded for our transgression. Uh -huh. Why the past tense? Or is that just like a, is that a weird translation? Or I don't get how a prophecy can be a past tense. I was always confused. Uh, it, a lot of the language in the Old Testament, Old Testament uh, imagery uh, is, 
I don't know if it's really an explanation, but what a biblical scholar would answer is it's proleptic. It's anticipatory. They've got a fancy word for it, but that uh, their understanding of divine realities pointed to the past and extended into the future. That uh, the deepest realities, the mysterious realities, had this transcendent quality to them. Uh, a, a strict historical, critical uh, analysis of that passage uh, would probably say it was the prophet himself that it was referring to the prophet having suffered for so long. Uh, which may also be the case, but insofar as we believe that it was a prophecy of Jesus Christ, it was proleptic. So there are other proleptic um, prophecies in the Old Testament? I the, uh, the, sac the, the, uh, the Passover sacrifice itself, uh, <coughs> when the Father is reading the account of the, uh, of the Passover, he says, when I was led out of Egypt. Uh, this is something that I may have passed over. The, uh, at, by the time of the, of the New Covenant, uh, their understanding of the Passover was not merely a recollection of what had taken place in the past. They believed it was a participation in the event itself, that it was a reality that transcended time, which has lots to do with our understanding of our participation in the sacrifice of, uh, of Jesus himself. Yes. So you mentioned the, the last cup didn't actually happen at the, the Last Supper. Yes. Uh, is there anything um, in any of the Gospels where the Apostles, you know, ask what happened to the Last Cup? Or, you know, no, it's <laughs> you know, one of the reasons you probably never, one of the reasons that you probably have never heard this before is because it's uh, implicit. The uh, the second and third cup aren't referred to this as the second and third cup. Luke refers to the cup after supper and the cup that is offered before Jesus explains the sacrifice. Uh, but at the time of the writing of the Gospels, when most Christians were of uh, a Jewish background, this would, have been, this would have been relatively clear, more so than it is to us. Uh, which part would have been clear to that? that uh, uh, that uh, in Luke's account, that it refers explicitly to the second cup and the third cup, and then is silent about the fourth. Okay. The, the Passover was supposed to end with the drinking of another cup, so, and that's conspicuously missing. So wouldn't the apostles have you know, been expecting another I think, cup? And, uh, uh, well, lots of things were different about this, yeah, and okay. we don't, you know, we don't uh, have any record of them being like, Jesus, what's what's going on? <laughs> well, I think by that point, they were probably used to Jesus and kind of doing new things. And, uh, okay. they just, by that time, they were just, they just roll with it. It was clear to them that this was something new. Yeah. You know, on that well, they, Obviously, it was very different than yeah. a, okay. a typical Passover. Very different. But they understood it to be a Passover, but a new Passover. Jesus had told them explicitly, yeah. okay. go prepare a Passover. Go prepare the Passover for us. And it happened in Jerusalem, and it happened at night, on the night of the Passover. Okay. So, it's about as yeah. you know, explicit as, yeah. <laughs> as it can get without saying, yes, the Last Supper was yeah. uh, a Passover. This reference to manna being from the beginning of creation, I mean, the first reference to it in the Bible is when they're walking through the desert. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I guess in what sense were um, the Israelites at the time when they started referring to this thought that it was from creation? <laughs> it, from the beginning the, of creation, from like Eden, more or less. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
it was first of all part of the oral tradition, and the, how far back the oral tradition extends is a matter of uh, a matter of speculation. But it, the Jewish interpretation of salvation history was anything but limited to the letter of uh, of the Torah and the the rest of the, the writings of the prophets. Uh, there were very elaborate, very elaborate, uh, uh, if uh, <laughs> it cre creative elaboration, a lot of creative elaboration was, uh, was going on. But the fact that it was a divine reality, the fact that it fell from heaven, the fact that this was the time when they were closest to God, uh, that They looked back on it as the perfect food. That's probably how this idea developed. That this bread by itself was enough to sustain them in their journey through the desert. It fell from heaven. It's something that God offered them. And so, maybe they just prayed and the Holy Spirit said, yes, that's... <laughs> uh, but not only that, it was present from, from creation. It was already, it was even then present in the temple, and that it was waiting for them when the Messiah would come again. Yes? Um, this may just be my mind. Now I'm a Jewish theology, but you talk about what they believe the Messiah would be like in that time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. sorry uh, you talked about what the Jewish people believe the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah yes. would be like. Is that any different from what they believe now, or is it similar kind of thinking? Uh, there are there are similarities and differences. Um, in the rabbinic tradition, um, synagogue tradition of Judaism is far more this worldly. Uh, there are plenty of Jewish traditions that don't believe in the life to come. But this was this was something that Jewish tradition was seeped in at the time of Jesus. Uh, Judaism at the time of Jesus was very eschatological, was really uh, seeing everything, interpreting everything in terms of this radical trans, uh, transition. Um, they interpreted literally. It, at the time, they interpreted uh, Isaiah's prophecy of a new heavens and a new earth very literally. And most Jews now, I think, would not interpret it literally. A uh, type is, uh, the word is Greek, and, oh, yes, uh, does anybody know the uh, actual translation of the word? Place? Place. Literally means place. Uh, and uh, it was also a, uh, a rhetorical device uh, to... Prefigure, it was a uh, prefigurement is the uh, easiest translation, I guess. A few examples. A few examples. In addition to uh, the manna being a type of the Eucharist, um, uh, the Davidic kings were a type of Jesus, the, uh, Jesus and Messiah. Um, there's probably thousands and soon. Now that you ask me, out. <laughs> uh, the tabernacle and the Mary being the tabernacle. The tabernacle being a type of Mary, or Mary's even Mary's womb. Isaac carrying um, a phenomenon to be sacrificed. He had to carry his own. Carry his own wood. Carry the wood of the of the wood on which he would be sacrificed. A type of Jesus carrying the cross. 